Hi, and welcome to video where we take a look at gesture recognition using the sign language MNIST dataset. So now let's move into our IPython notebook to get started with this exercise. All right, so let's open file number 16 called gesture recognition. And I already have it open here, so I'm just going to click on it here. So this is the sign language, the MNIST sign language dataset that we're going to do. This is the American sign language. I guess you can call it signs or language, I'm guessing, or symbolic language. Either way, this is what we're going to be training our neural network or CNN on. Okay, so now let's get started. So firstly, let's import the libraries we'll be using. And that should be done in yeah, about now. Seaborn is, by the way, a plotting library or visualization library. Along with matplotlib, we're going to be using it to do some visualizations that you'll see shortly. And what we're going to do our data is not in the same format as we had before. It's in a CSV file. So if you know how to use pandas, you know there's this very simple function called pd.readcsv. We call it pd because that's how we import pandas here as pd. And we're going to take a look at that data right now. So let's load this first. It takes a couple of seconds again. And now you can do train.head. Head gives you the first six entries in our data set here, the first five, I should say. And what's happening here is that we're going to have the first column here is a label. So we have label 362213. What does that mean? Firstly, this is what it means. This is label 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, and so on, all the way to 24, I believe, because they left out the letter J and the letter Z. Okay? There's a reason for it, kind of forgot right now, but I'll read it in between this lesson and remind you guys of it. Okay, well, I just actually had to look it up myself. And the reason for it is because both J and Z require motion, which we can do here. I mean, we can do it, but it's not represented in our image data set here. So we're just going to ignore it for now. But take a look at this, by the way. You can see we have columns. Columns mean pixel 1, pixel 2, all the way to pixel 784. So what's the significance of 784? Well, 784 is actually 28 by 28. So this follows the same dimensions as the MNIST data set, which is 28 by 28 grayscale pixels. These are values of the grayscale value in the data set here. So if we were to reconstruct this into an image, you'd have to get pixel 1 to 28 as a top row, then pixel 29 to 56 as a second row, and so on and so on, and stack them up. And that would give us our images, which we will do in code shortly. So now, firstly, let's remove labels. To get labels out of it, we just get do this, train labels, get the values, and assign it to labels here. So that's done. This is a pandas technique in how we extract columns. And let's just see the unique values in our labels here, which we can actually see using NB unique. Or you could have used pandas as well. But since we have gotten our labels here, we're just going to use numpy. And we get 24. You can see the values here. 0, uh, we left out 9, and it goes all the way to 24 instead of 25, or 26, I should say. Now we're going to use Seaborn here. This is the plot size we're going to use. If this is too big for your screen resolution, you can adjust it to suit. This is the width and this is the height. And we're going to just do a count plot. This gives us how many values in our data set. So before in our MNIST data set, we had equal numbers of 1s, 2s, and 3s, or roughly equal. We actually didn't explore this, that data like this. And the numbers weren't actually even. However, they were very, very close to even. This one is slightly more imbalanced, but this is totally fine. We can work with this. They're all roughly between, I would say, 900 to 1200, or actually it's above 1200 here. So that's okay. So then what we do now, we drop our training or label data set from it, because what we want, we just want to remove this, this column here just to get the pixel data as our training data set here. So we do that. And then what we do, this is how, remember I said we were going to reshape the data to basically stack the 28 upon each other. That's what we can easily do with this function here, this numpy reshape function for i in images. And we just reshape i. That means we're going to do all the images in our data set in a quick batch. And then we're going to flatten it here and then do it again here. All right. And if you wanted just to check it, you can actually run this on an image by image basis or on a, just to make sure it works. Okay, so let's run this now. Let's run the label binarizer, which does hot one encoding, which you've seen before. Just another way to do it. And we can check it out to make sure it works. Can't really see the full extent of the 
how many values are in this row, but it should be 24. You can actually check one if you wanted to see. You can just do this. Then, and you'll see it should be 24. Exactly. All right. Actually, I'm going to leave this code in case you want, you guys wanted to see. Yep, everything is in order. Let's just bring this back up here and comment it out in case you guys still want to see it. Okay, so now let's inspect this image here. So we're going to actually use plot show here to visualize the data right now. If we didn't use CMAP gray here because I wanted to show you guys how it looks. If you were to visualize this as a color image here, it tries its best. It's going to look funny, but this is how it sort of looks using this is matplotlib's interpretation of it so you can see this corresponds to i'm not even sure what that symbol is i'm not now saying language it's a c yep okay so that's pretty cool now we can actually do the same with opencv opencv we're going to actually bring it up as a gray scale image so we're going to take a look at 10 random images in our data set here so this is a good idea of what our image data set looks like our training image data set so what we do next we simply take our data here and we just apply the sklearn train test split function because remember we just have our data in the other form but what we're going to do we're going to actually take our data here images that we created you can actually see that it's somewhere here we created and we're going to split it up here all right into 70 to t ratio and what we're going to do we're going to train our model test on this and remember we held back some data here now, if you wanted this is a Kaggle project by the way Kaggle projects, they usually have a separate test data set that we submit the results to. We're not going to actually do that today. We're just going to train on our training data set. However, we are just going to train, do it in a, in a Kaggle practical project way where we have three data sets. We have our training data set, our test data set that we know how it performs on, and then a totally unknown test data set that our model is going to try to predict it's on so we can assess and compare its performance with other people and other classifiers or models out there. So now let's begin to train our model. So this is just, we just do the inputs. We declare our batch size, we're trying to bigger batch size now, define number of classes, number of epochs. So let's run these here. Don't know if I ran this yet. I didn't, and now let's run this. This takes a little while, maybe about five, 10 seconds, just because it's importing these things. And now we're gonna scale our images here, all right? And then now we're going to reshape them to the format that Keras likes. And just we're going to make sure this looks okay, just to be sure. And now we're going to create our model. So I'm not going to go into this model in detail. This is going to be sort of like a homework practice exercise for you guys, just to go ahead, go through and understand the model that's designed here. Actually a very simple model to be fair. And let's just run this code to create our model. And then we're going to compile our model. And it didn't actually do it here, but let's just print the model summary in the end. So now let's compile our model, which we did already. Print the summary, so you can just see the actual shape. It's a very simple model, 85,000 parameters. It's quite small, which is why I can probably let this train here. And I'll just fast forward this video as it trains. So let's run this. And you can actually see the training process as we go. I actually wanted to discuss this in the last video and I forgot to. What's happening here is that you actually see the ETA, how much, it's like an estimation of how long it's going to take to finish this epoch. The loss, you can see the loss going down steadily. And you can see the accuracy hopefully going up steadily as well. So I actually find it's pretty cool. Sometimes when I'm, I'm a bit bored, sometimes I just leave this and just stare at it for like a couple of minutes. It does amuse my colleagues when I used to do this. I don't know why, just because maybe I looked a bit odd doing it. But I find it quite fascinating because it's like, it's like almost like a little game seeing, oh, my accuracy is going up, my loss is going down. I wonder what's my validation accuracy going to be, especially when it's down at the end here. It's quite cool to anticipate what those results are. So I'm going to leave this letter to run, this tiny box, and I'll fast forward the video from here. All right, so we've done with that. It's a few minutes later, and you can see our accuracy and our validation Data set is quite good, 99.7 minutes, and they are perfect, actually. Uh, we could even run it a bit more to get closer to 100%, if that was possible, might have been. But either way, that's pretty cool that we got so close to being 100% accurate. So I recommend you save your model again here. And now let's do some plots here. You can actually see the accuracy plots on both the test and training data set move into the directions we wanted to. A lot of times in reality, your 
training data set may actually show lower accuracy than your test data set. We just happen to be lucky here. And now we can actually do one for validation loss if you wanted. I just actually did not do it here. Okay. Now, what I'm about to do is actually evaluate its performance on the unseen test data that we have before. So we can actually run this piece of code here and it generates the predictions for the test images that it hasn't seen before. And now you can get an accuracy score here. So 80%, so that's not great, but it's pretty good still. It's reasonably good, I should say. Just depends on the actual data on how well better models or superior models have performed, but this is tolerable. So what I'm gonna do now, I'm actually gonna test this on our real life webcam data. So firstly, I'm just gonna create a function that just looks up the labels here. So we have all labels matching the letters and it just returns error if it's not there. And then what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna test it on actual webcam input here. So that's this code here. What this code does is just extracts a region where my hand is gonna be in these shapes. So let's look at the shapes above that I'm gonna try it with. Let's see, maybe we should try it with probably A, and A can be fairly easy. Then we can look at maybe a V as well. Okay, and maybe even a C or B, all right. So let's see if we get those things. Let's remember what this is again. Yeah, I remember those symbols now, so let's go. All right, so let's test this on a webcam here. This is some pretty cool. This is why we teach, we taught this course with OpenCV in the beginning, so you can actually understand and build little things like this, all right? Okay, so I'm just gonna run this code here. There we go, let me move my microphone out of the way. Hopefully you can still hear me. All right, so let's test this out with an A. And we get an M. Let me actually bring up what an M looks like. So you can see it while I try to match these two. Okay, so let's try an A or M. Apparently gets that right. That's cool. Let us try I, no, it doesn't look, it it's a little cute, it's very not good. Let's try a V, I think it's an X, not good. Let's try an F, try a different hand, still doesn't look too good. Let's try a C, I think it's an E, it's an absurd. I think I got a C just now, did I? Okay, so let's close this. So what you can tell quickly is that it did not work good. It didn't work well at all. And there are many reasons for it. Firstly, the pre-processing of, I was feeding raw images into here and just resizing and grayscaling it and then reshaping it into the format before. However, if you go up above, and uh, let's look at the OpenCV samples, actually this one, you can see, Maybe my background was too cluttered. Maybe I needed to flip my images. Maybe my hands were just not good at sign language or whatever, but you can see it actually did not perform well at all. And that's big reason why a big weakness in basically, I should say machine learning or even computer vision in that real world data doesn't actually match quite often the data set, the distribution that you, you trained your machine learning algorithm on. It's a very common problem. And you can see it here. So what does this mean? This means that performances just generally have the notes here, less than adequate in our training data because our real life data is different. So what we're gonna do in the next video is create our own gesture recognition system or engine using our very own data that you'll create by yourself or on your own in using a webcam and OpenCV. So let's stay tuned for the next lesson. So to quickly summarize what you've just learned, you've just learned how to create a CNN and train it on our sign language MNIST data set. You loaded our data, you trained the model, you analyzed and tested the performance, and you understood why it was such a poorly performing network. So now let's move on to creating or building your own gesture recognition system with your own data. That's in the next video, so thank you.